Okay, so sorry about that. We're going to get started now. So um, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Wisconsin Online Global Program and Grants um, webinar. Um, we're welcoming you uh, to this webinar about online business development tools for a COVID age or social distancing age. We appreciate you guys staying on, even though we had uh, technical difficulties, we really, really appreciate it. Um, and let's take a look together as to some ways that websites can help us all navigate through these really uncertain times and help us grow our business and brand internationally. So um, let's jump right in. Um, so my name is Samantha Sofici. I am a business development manager for IBT Online. And um, I'm joined today by Susanna Hardy, who's our chief content officer. So um, she gets involved with content for websites, SEO, keywords, social media, anything, anything basically online. Um, we are really delighted to have a team from Wisconsin to help um, Wisconsin companies understand the resources available and also what websites and online tools can do from a company perspective. So today we have um, Katie Sinat, and she is Vice President of the International Business Development for the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. And she's responsible for developing and implementing all the strategies for Wisconsin companies to expand their international sales and also look after foreign direct investment for Wisconsin. Also on the WEDC team today, we have Aaron, um, International Grants Manager for WEDC. He is responsible for leading the WEDC's um, international grant programs, both state and federal funding. And Alan will be taking us through some of the resources available for uh, Wisconsin exporters, and particularly those that apply to the online tools that we'll, that we'll talk about today. And we are very grateful to Laurent, um, Laurent Leduc, for taking the time to join us today. Laurent is the Director of International Business for AMSOIL. Um, he is native of France, who now calls Wisconsin home, and he's known for his expertise in all aspects of product launches, branding, sales, and regulatory affairs for the domestic and international international business to business. So a uh, really packed day, and we, we wasted a little time in the beginning. Sorry again about that, um, but a brief word about who IBT Online is. So we are a private company with US headquarters um, where, and we have a team in the UK where a lot of our market, marketing team is located. We are 100% focused on building, hosting, managing um, the online tools for, for our clients to help them grow their business internationally. And this falls under two categories for us, um, both in website localization and international online marketing. Perhaps that's our greatest unique selling point is that we work and think and act globally and have done so since our creation in 2002. So today's agenda we have divided today into six, six sections and our aim is to provide you with an information packed, pragmatic and helpful resource, including time at the end for, for your questions. Um, so please don't do keep them popping into that chat box. We'll make sure to answer them. Um, either through during our Q&A or um, Joelle will be, will be also answering some questions in the background. Um, so we're going to start with a summary of the WEDC and what they're doing today to help uh, Wisconsin companies. And um, then we're going to explore why do exporters need localized websites? Um, what online business development tools can help you in, in this time of social distancing? How do exporters use localized websites? And that's what, where we will hear a personal case story from Laurent from Amsoil. And then we'll take a deeper dive into the Wisconsin Online Global Program and the grants. Um, and then finally, takeaways and Q&A. So um, let's start off strong with the WEDC resources for Wisconsin companies. So over to Katie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for starting us off, Samantha. Um, as Samantha said, I'm Katie Sinnott with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, and I really hope that everyone on this call is staying safe and healthy. My thoughts are with all whose family and friends are affected by this virus, and I appreciate the opportunity to address each of you today and for your time to learn about an important resource available to you. I feel that this is an increasingly relevant topic that our international trade division with the WEDC can further support you with. 
I think it's safe to say that we're all affected by the current situation from business closures to working from home, social distancing, and so many more ways that our lives have been disrupted over the past few months. That's why I wanted to take the time today to connect with you and discuss the importance of your website presence and inform you of WEDC's international services to the broader business community. I also wanted to take a moment to go through what WEDC has done in the past to help companies affected by COVID-19, as well as what we are doing going forward. I'm not going to cover each program in great detail, but we really have responded to many of the challenges significantly. And as an organization, I'm proud to say that we're able to quickly mobilize and repurpose funds and provide guidance to help support businesses through this time in pretty targeted ways. So if we look at what we've done, we worked very heavily with Wisconsin small businesses to access the small business um, the SBA funds, for example, the payroll protection funds and different things like that. Also during the safer at home order, we work to help define essential businesses. As that is no longer in place, it's important that you connect with your local chambers and your local EDOs to understand what the regulations are in your area, because they will be different by area. We also created a program called the Small Business 2020 Grant. And this was $20,000 grants from our community development financial institutions to existing clients. So those are the programs we've done in the past. Let's go to the next slide. I'd like to talk a bit about what we're doing today in addition to those previous programs. The most significant was announced by Governor Evers yesterday. It's called the we're all in program and this includes a hundred million dollars that was allocated to WEDC, 75 million dollars from of it from the CARES Act fund will be distributed to companies of 20 employees or less targeting the most distressed industries. These grants will be of the size of two thousand five hundred dollars and we will reach about 30,000 businesses in the state. So this is a really important um, program that has just been announced yesterday and the application process will open in June. We also have done something to help our industries think about opening up if you were closed during the safer at home order. On the WEDC website, we have two types of guidelines. We have the general guidelines on reopening, talks about things like social distancing, disinfecting your work environment, and even what to do when you have a sick employee. In addition to that, we have worked with industry organizations around the United States to define industry-focused guidelines on how to operate safely and how to protect your employees and clients. So whether you're a manufacturer, a restaurant owner, you own a construction company, agriculture, hair and nail salons, if you go onto this link, you'll be able to find industry specific guidelines on operating safely. Another grant program that we have created under the We're All In program is the Ethnic Minority Emergency Grants. This is really focused on those micro businesses of five full-time employees or less. Those small businesses who have been hit very hard and have not been open during this whole time. So WEDC has allocated $2 million with grants of $2,000 each and will uh, support about a thousand businesses. These businesses need to be in the retail, hospitality, or service sector, and you can't have received other funds from WEDC or SBA. So that grant is actually open at this moment, and it will be open all week. The focus forward is super important. I really want everyone on the call to. Um, 
go to this website and look here because we have all sorts of different resources for you to deal with COVID-19. We have the industry focus guidelines. We have the general guidelines. We have Secretary Missy Hughes who does a 15, 20 minute live stream every Monday. So you can hear the latest announcements. And if you sign up there, each time a new program comes out to support you, you'd receive an email about that update every week. So that's a, a really important place to go and bookmark that and sign up for those um, emails. The last thing I wanted to point out before I hand it back over to our IBT team is the Wisconsin Suppliers Network. So this was originally designed so that companies in Wisconsin could find local suppliers for their supply chain. From COVID-19, we've added a section onto this website where you can go and find out who is providing personal protective equipment so that you can open your manufacturing operations or your restaurant or whatever business you're running safely. So if you go onto this website, you will find Wisconsin companies providing PPE or personal protective equipment like masks, gloves, face shields and plexiglass. So all of those things you need to keep your employees and customers safe, you can find from your partner Wisconsin companies. So I suggest that you go and check that out. So again, I really wanted to thank you all for taking the time to come and talk to us and learn about these important things that we're doing during COVID-19, but also how we can help you as you emerge. And exporting will be a very important element of that. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Katie, thank you so much for uh, those in-depth and, and, and a tremendous list of resources for Wisconsin companies. Um, we're now gonna start uh, talking about why do exporters need localized websites and, and what we think that these things can do for, uh, for, um, uh, for, for Wisconsin exporters. Um, Samantha, do you wanna take us through these things? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Susanna. So we know that unfortunately COVID is a global pandemic, but it's clearly not just a health issue, but it's also affected us economically and socially. So for business, COVID-19 affects all aspects and every, all aspects of your business and everyone's business worldwide. So all decisions at the moment have to be taken with that current environment in mind. And the route out of this for businesses will definitely depend on each company's circumstances, but online is clearly key. We all need to try new and innovative online solutions to safeguard our business and get back to a level, get back to a level footing and even growth. So talking to companies in the US, in Mexico, in Canada, Japan, um, there are four big issues that we see. So the business priorities right now are first to look after employees, and Katie highlighted a few really great things. Um, managing, managing costs and cash flow. So, sorry, on the next slide. Um, maintaining supply chains and existing partnerships is number three. And then number four is generating sales, exports, and business. These are what we are hearing again and again from companies. Now, this webinar will focus on that last priority of the list, so generating sales, exports, and business, and doing that with online tools is our expertise. So on the next slide, um, we like to look at an overview of the global internet use. Um, so as of January 2020, more than 4.5 billion people across the globe are on the internet, which is about 60% of the world's population and it's growing. Um, last year, some 300 million new users plugged into the, into the internet. And when we analyze the number of people online and their behavior, I want to draw your attention to the average amount spent, which is um, that, that number on the right, which is about nearly seven hours a day, and that's an average. I'm trying to find stats on how many hours are spent on the internet since um, COVID-19, social distancing, um, the quarantine, kind of state that we're in right now. And it's really hard to find uh, solid numbers, but the indication is that the average is topping at about eight and a half hours a day. So if there's one takeaway from the slide is that across the globe, your customers, prospects, leads, future distributors, future employers, um, suppliers, pretty much everybody that your business interacts with is online and they're spending most of their day online. And one of the main things that they're doing is communicating. 
again, uh, COVID-19 has massively increased that because of re remote working and, and um, people are communicating with each other through social media. And um, their social media behaviors is also being impacted. Um, for example, COVID-19, if you look at the next slide, um, COVID-19 has, has um, made LinkedIn even more relevant than it was before, for example. Um, an article came out on the fin Financial Times saying that more people are posting more stuff on LinkedIn because um, they want to stay relevant. So when normal business re resumes, they're on they're on people's top of mind and their customers and suppliers. And the numbers absolutely back it up. So LinkedIn shared that the number of conversations between members jumped 55% in March from the same month last year. And live broadcasts have, all, have also gone into absolute overdrive. Um, the demand has more than tripled since February, and the users are much more chatty on, on these broadcasts. Um, the number of comments on the broadcast has surged 272%. And what's important to keep in mind is that online isn't just for B2C companies. Um, online is absolutely for everyone. Um, and this is an important slide for, especially for Wisconsin, because a lot of Wisconsin companies are in that B2B space. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that when you're talking to, even though you're B2B, there is another person on that other side. So they have, they the way that they purchase for themselves is usually pretty similar to the way that they purchase for their, for their business or the business that they work with. And it's backed up by the numbers. So 94% of B2B purchases are researched before contact, contacting a sales rep or a distributor. Um, over 70% of searches start with a genetic search a generic search uh, like CRM software. So it's really important to keep in mind that your online presence is absolutely key before, but especially now in, in this COVID-19 age. Thanks, Samantha. That was that was and a great introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, especially for B2B companies, uh, the fact that so many trade shows have been canceled and postponed is pretty distressing, since that's where a lot of people are getting their new distributors and reaching out their their prospects and checking out their competitors. So you know, your online again again has reinforced this whole notion of online business development tools. Uh, basically your websites, your social media and online marketing. The key that we are finding for uh, uh, for companies at the moment who are who have not been able to participate in trade shows, there, I guess there's two things. One, there's an increasing level of online virtual trade shows, and I think there's a whole lot of them coming through. And the second thing that I think is important, really important right now, is just to lean in to the um, to your existing relationships and existing client base, you know, really lean into those relationships um, uh, and 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 you know focus on 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 your online presence, on your international business, and on your on your on your core websites like that. Um, I guess one of the key messages we also want to talk about is just being prepared, being prepared for the uh, for the rebound. Um, and on the next slide, we've just sort of highlighted that the rebound, we don't know when it's going to happen or, or what, you know, what shape it's going to happen or anything like that. We don't, we, we're, we, you know, the crystal ball in that sense, but we do know it is, it is, it is, it will happen. The, you know, the world could well be a different place after that, but we are sure that there will be a rebound. And um, I think every company is also keen to uh, have sort of some lead indicators one of the, the companies we work with is, is in the aviation sector. And uh, the chart on this, on, this, on this next slide shows you one of the key indicators that they're watching carefully um, to, to see where and when they can sort of jump back in and, 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 and try and pick up some business here. The dark red line on that graph is um, the response to passenger numbers in China post COVID or with COVID-19, the slope of that curve is steeper than anything they witnessed either in SARS or even 9-11. But uh, the pickup since has also been more dramatic and sharper. Again, we're, you know, most people think that there could be some double dips or some seesawing in that, in that recovery. But I think every company at the moment is really just trying to find um, 
just trying to find some kind of uh, a, a key indicator to watch. Um, one of the ones we were watching as well, just in the consumer sector, is Hermes and uh, their um, uh, their key flagship store in Guangzhou uh, oh, reopened about two weekends ago and had an absolute record number of, of uh, sales. They clocked up $2.7 million of turnover sales in one day. It's the largest they've ever had uh, for any store anywhere in the world. And, and on the left-hand side, you just have some screenshots as Chinese social media went, went, went berserk that day, just looking at, at, at and, and posting and reposting um, these are WeChat and, and Weibo shots um, uh, of, of people shopping there and saying, look, I, I got a cup of coffee in, in, in an Hermes shop. I think, I think our point really is to say, th prepare for the rebound in, and, and, and watch the key indicators, figure out which countries are gonna be there first. Where's your low hanging fruit? on that um, and with that we want to also just to, to mention sort of you know a, a, a thing to do for your websites best practice for your websites right now focus on you know the fact that you're open for business uh, if you if you are able to sell right now it could well be in a different format you might have different office hours different ways of being contacted please make sure that it's clear uh, including to your distributors especially your international distributors if there is business out there to be to be to be had, make sure that people know that you are open for business, that you can transact, that you are willing to to go, that you have stock, um, and so on. So that's one of the other key things that we're we're uh, advising um, in terms of so just just using your existing online tools. I guess in conclusion for this very first part of the of the um, of the webinar. Really, uh, just from our point of view, first part is why do Wisconsin exporters need localized websites? For us, there's really, I guess, two points on this. The first is that the world is online. And for an SME, that is good news. As Samantha said, you know, that's, that's, that's actually good, it's comforting. You know exactly where your buyers are. You know where your prospective buyers are. They're all online. And you know how to reach them social media, online marketing, and your website. And for us as well, preparing for the rebound right now, preparing to grasp what business there is, means adopting and using and implementing good, solid online business development tools, uh, you know, websites and online marketing. So, so that's the, the, the message from us on um, the start. Now let's talk about what those online business development tools are. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and basically they fall into two categories. There's two on your core online business development tools, your website, and these can be e-commerce enabled or not. They can be B2B sites, they can be B2C sites, B2G, b 2 government, anything, all of different parameters, but they're, it's all a website. And then there's online marketing, which basically you use uh, your website is a springboard for that online marketing, and there's two types of online marketing, search engine marketing and social media marketing. And we'll get down to, to some of those um, in, uh, in a little while. But just to say that those are the two basic, basic uh, online, you know, everything else is, is sort of a derivative of those, of those two core uh, business development tools to use. And when we look at strategies, uh, for, for our companies going international. Let's say you have a, a terrific U.S. website, you know, great U.S. website based in Wisconsin, in American English, hosted in America. Um, it's, it's, it's very U.S.-centric, which is terrific uh, for your, your U.S. core base in Wisconsin. And around that Wisconsin website, you've got some social media going, you've got some blogs coming out, you're, you're, you're regularly looking to make sure it's optimized for, for search engines, so it's SEO'd. But how are your top clients, let's say you've got really fantastic buyers and prospects in France, how are they finding you, interacting with you? Um, you know, you, you might have, you know, you say, is France worthy of its own website? Uh, there's enough business out there. And we think there's lots more business to be had. Perhaps it's worthy of its own website. And, um, and therefore its own little SEO and social media environment. Same thing with say Brazil, if, if that's another target market. These can all interact and connect back to your Wisconsin website, but they act as, 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 as springboards to really 
dive into those markets and inter in, engage with those markets and make sure that your prospective buyers in France or Brazil in this case can find you and can have the trust that they need for that buyer's journey to engage with you and buy from you. And that's that's really some of the things we want to talk about today. But there's one aspect of anything online, whether it's whether it's a website, whether it's whether it's your online media. There's one aspect which is really critical for understanding how those business development website uh, um, tools work, and that is that everything on the web is customer or searcher centric. So uh, you know it. it, it it has put the customer, your client, at the center of it. He's able to communicate with other customers whenever he wants, and then with you. And your job, in terms of a sales guy or in terms of marketing, is to try and influence those black arrows that go from customer to customer in a favorable light. In other words, to put your head above the parapet and make sure that they that they see you uh, and that they engage with you. So, so that's that's some of the things. So remember this notion of being customer centric, searcher centric. Now all search engines everywhere share that, and there are lots of different search engines around in the world. Um, on this next slide, I'll show you just sort of a, a, a brief sort of a, a landscape of the different types of search engines. And Google is by far the global leader. But I think what's interesting now is that search engines like this, the historic search engines, are now being joined by a lot of new ones or, or social media aspects uh, 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 platforms. YouTube is now often used like a search engine. Um, uh, WhatsApp is used in many markets like a search engine. You go on YouTube to say, you know, where, how do I fix my whatever it is, or where can I buy this? So that's basically like a search engine. But all of them are done that same searcher-centric way. We take a quick dive into Google um, as an example of how search engines work. So why the question is, you know, why can't I just use my Wisconsin website to go global? I've got this great website, I've spent money and time and resource on it. I've got some French prospective buyers. I know I can get better business if I have, you know, if if, if, if I could reach out to them. I know there's lots of potential business in France. I stick some French pages onto my Wisconsin website. Isn't that enough? It's not. Google then says, oh, you've got a Wisconsin website and you've got some French pages on it, so you're looking for French people around you in Wisconsin. Well, there are some, but those are not the ones that you're looking to target in France. Because, again, search engines are localized. In other words, they're taking the customer-centric, searcher-centric point of view. Google.fr is not the same as Google.com. In France, you're looking at Google.fr. It's in French. Um, uh, Google says, you know, if that searcher, what is relevant to that searcher has to be hosted nearby, has to have French content, be relevant in France, be digitally compliant in France. So there's lots of different uh, as attributes that go into making a localized website. Language is one of them. Let me give you an example of localizing language, um, even for within a certain language, within the same language. So here you've got a, a distinction between car, in, in Spanish, between Spain and Mexico. Now, let's say you're targeting, let's say you're a Wisconsin company in the auto sector and you're targeting Spain and you're using the word auto. 9% of people searching on the internet use the word auto in Spain. So by not using the right keyword, you are taking away 91% of your potential audience. Same search engine, it's Google same language, Spanish, different keywords, and therefore for your marketing side, it's going to have different Google ad campaigns. But again, that's just an example of, you know, keywords that are so important um, in, in, in the various languages. On this next slide, I, um, Samantha and I were doing a sort of like little, little, little search here, and we said, well, what's relevant for these days of social distancing when we're probably all sitting at home? Well, what you don't want is your dog barking in the middle of a webinar. So squeakless dog toys is relevant. So Samantha sits in Florida and she went squeakless dog toys on Google.com. You see at the top of that left-hand side of the page, Google.com. I'm sitting in the UK at the moment. So I'm going on to Google.co.uk. The results we get are very different. Okay, there's an Amazon, but even then, Amazon.co.uk is a different Amazon. I get timeforpause.co.uk. 
and Samantha gets freedompoolharness.com. These are very different results. You know, if you're in the squeakless dog toy market, you need to have a relevance for the UK market. Google UK needs to find you relevant to me. Let's talk about sort of, a, um, I've, I've listed, I've, I've talked a little about website localization. I've listed here the 10 criteria that we use to localize a website. So to build a website which is localized in, the, in a target destination market, you'd want to have all of those things. You'd want to be hosted optimally. You'd want to have the regulatory requirements correct, uh, multilingual navigation, having the right URL, right domain name, all of those things. Language is one out of 10. Uh, so, so, so just, you know, when we're, when we're looking at, at localizing things, localizing um, your websites, localizing online marketing, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just a, a sort of translation job. That's the easy part. But the step one, the number one step that you need to take is to have a localized web website, which is customer centric. That means being found and being understood with all those different types of layers that build the trust and engagement that you need for the buyer's journey. Before we talk more in depth about a buyer's journey, let's just talk quickly about a buyer's persona. What is a buyer persona? I mean, Samantha, why don't you take us through what a buyer, what is a buyer's persona? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. So as HubSpot defines it, a buyer persona is a semi-fictional representation of your ideal customer based on market research and real data about your existing customers. So the point about defining your buyer persona is that it allows you to make sure that you are always reaching the right person at the right time with the right message. So that saves you and your company a ton of time and resources. And when you think about your buyer persona um, and who that buyer persona would be, you can start by thinking about what language they speak, um, their age, where they live, their income, and what they buy, and, and there's so much more that you can think about. Um, a really great example of a domestic buyer persona is um, Zipcar. So um, here's, so Zipcar, in their own mission statement, they even include who their buy, main buyer persona would be, someone who's urban, educated, um, tech savvy, and environmentally conscious. And you can totally tell by their Instagram post that you see on the right hand side. Um, it's two people. Um, look, they look pretty young. They're holding plants. So they look they look like they would be environmentally friendly. And they're obviously in an urban environment based on their background. And so the good news is that for you, um, figuring out who your buyer persona is not shouldn't be very hard to do because you already know the main attributes of your main buyer persona because of um, who your current customers are. But what's important to note is that you're, you can have many buyer personas um, and your international buyer personas can and they probably should be different from your domestic buyer personas. So just kind of diving into that, especially in the times that we're in today, um, you should definitely ask yourself some questions regarding your international buyer persona. Uh, for example, are there multiple buyer personas for my expert markets? How do they typically find me? What do they really care about? And in this example, we use L'Oreal because they're frequently cited for how absolutely spot on they are for their international online marketing. And if you look at this picture in the text, it's L'Oreal assuring their US stylists that they're committed to support them while, they, while we are socially distancing ourselves. Um, L'Oreal knows that their buyer persona is most likely a small business owner or somebody who works for a small business. And the majority of stylists right now are closed because of, of quarantine and social distancing. So um, their messaging, their pictures is reflective of what they know the US views as, as an issue that's really important right now, which is support for SMEs. And the next example is um, L'Oreal Australia. And uh, for L'Oreal Australia, the message is completely different. There's no mention of COVID-19, of coronavirus, of stylists. Um, but instead of focus on climate, and this is most likely due to the horrible fires that Australia suffered just a few months ago, and that is what matters to their buyer persona right now. 
And then in the last example, L'Oreal Brazil is demonstrating to Brazilian customers that they're doing their best to help the people of Brazil by producing hand sanitizer, which is something that they don't typically produce. So as you can see by that example, um, each buyer persona is clearly different and, and L'Oreal's messaging is respectful of that. Samantha, that's terrific. A great synopsis of what is a buyer persona and some examples of how companies engage with that individual buyer persona in a localized way. We're gonna launch a quick poll now. We just wanna sort of launch a poll to ask you about some of your markets that you're looking at. So what are your top target markets right now? Um, you know, and, and, and by the way, we only had five options. <laughs> so sorry if it looks a little bit restricted, if you're, if you're really interested in you know, Africa or something like that, but we thought we'd add Canada there since so many of you have uh, a lot of interest in, in Canada. So, um, please click on the com the areas, regions, countries that interest you most. And uh, indeed, we see that there is a lot of interest in Canada and Wisconsin. Doesn't surprise us. Um, but I'm very, very pleased to see how many of you are interested in Europe, in Asia Pacific, and uh, as well as that, some of you also in in Latin America. That's terrific. That's very, very fantastic. Thank you. We're going to be closing the poll now and back to our, our, our slide deck. And on the next slide, we wanted to show you um, some examples of, of, of marketing and that you could look at. And, and what I wanted to show you was some examples, again, about localization, about differences in markets um, uh, around the world. Now, this is a B2B company uh, um, that we've been working with for a couple of years. And they have some 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 pretty exotic markets. They have uh, they they so we do their marketing in Indonesia. That's the red and white flag, by the way, Indonesia and Germany. Uh, as I said, this is a B two B company. And um, uh, this is a snapshot a screen share of of one month. Same uh, same search engine in both. You know, Google's dominant in Indonesia and in Germany. Same Facebook um, uh, platform that we used very similar, uh, same product as well um, uh, uh, for, for each kind. We were uh, really patting ourselves on the back with our German reach. We reached nine and a half thousand people and we got uh, over a thousand post clicks. Uh, we got 14 likes, which for the very, very um, tight-lipped Germans, let's say, is a, you know, fist punch in the air uh, result as far as we were concerned. So we were really pleased on that one. Indonesia blew us out of the water. Look at that, 300, nearly 371,658 um, uh, people reached just for, for that one post on that one. Over nearly, tw nearly 20,000 post clicks. We had ha-has and loves and likes and shares and wows and a lot, lot, lot of interaction with this. So um, again, very, very, I mean, obviously localized for the different languages and all that, but nevertheless, a similar, a similar um, result. The point is to look a little bit further into this. Dig down one layer further. And if we look over 12 months of this and look not just in terms of those vanities, but also what's happening in terms of, of, of the conversions on that, you get a different result as well. And again, this is important when you're looking at any kind of on, thing on social media and online marketing. The, in this chart, you have Indonesia on the top, Germany on the bottom, over 12 months. Again, same company, B2B, um, running, running very similar um, uh, campaigns across the two markets. The blue and the red columns equal the engagement. How many people are reaching it, you know, sharing it, clicking on it, and so on. It's great. The yellow and the green bars, a little bit harder to see, but are really important. That's conversion. That's how many people actually clicked on request a quote or download the data sheets because they're actually really interested. They're not just like, wow, this is a cool product. No, they want to have like, what's the price of this and where can I buy it? And what's really interesting is that in Indonesia, you need about three times the level of engagement to get the same level of conversion that you do in Germany. It's a different style of market. Indonesia is a very reactive, very responsive market. Germany is not. But the conversion rates, what you're actually selling, 
is pretty similar. So that's just an example, but we, we don't want to have, we don't, we, we, you can't spend too long on this current, on this, uh, on, on online marketing. But again, I would like to launch a quick poll uh, on this, um, if we, if we could, just uh, launching a quick poll about would you like to have a webinar on um, uh, online marketing for Wisconsin companies? You know, are you interested in having another webinar just on online marketing? If so, let us know, and we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, an outstanding response. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, we will be getting back to you with hopefully uh, um, with some with some some news on that. But we really appreciate your responses on that, and um, uh, and the interest. Thank you very much indeed on that. Um, okay, close that poll. Go back to uh, uh, our marketing example. And on the next slide as well, something we're asked a lot about is how to prioritize markets. For most of you, it's absolutely clear. You know, most of you say, I've got my low hanging fruit over here. It's in Canada, it's in Mexico, it's in Japan, it's wherever it is. You know very well where that extra tool will bring you more business. But sometimes we have clients who say, well, I'm not really sure. One way, one way of looking is to look at your US website. This is a client who has, I mean, their, their monthly stat they had about 190,000 people visits, individual visits on their US website. That 68% came from the US. So, you know, 32% of the visits from their website came from outside the US. Now that's quite something. If you look on this graph, for example, nearly 20,000 people from Mexico visited that US website. That means that 20,000 Mexico, Mexicans were, went out of their comfort zone. They went to a different Google, a different language. They looked really, really hard to find it and they found it. They went totally out of their comfort zone, but they found this. Despite all those barriers, they're interested in that company. That may tell you that there is a genuine interest in that market for this company. A very, you know, and at the bottom, you've got a, 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 little, a little calculation. 2% conversion rate is absolutely standard. And, uh, you know, how many orders per month? Well, you can fill in those numbers there. Uh, but that's one way of looking to see whether it's worth having a Mexican website. Because if you think that 20,000 Mexicans are going out of their comfort zone to get to that U.S. website, just think of your results if you had, um, if you had a, a genuine localized US uh, Mexican website. The last thing on our on our sort of whirlwind tour of online business development tools is uh, e-commerce. Um, Samantha, uh, uh, maybe you could give us a quick, quick rundown on e-commerce. Yeah, I would be happy to. So first things first, you have to have a sense for how big it is. Um, Three and a half trillion dollars globally. And out of a world, uh, total world, world population of seven and a half billion, four and a half billion being online and 3.4 billion shopping online, that means 45% of the world's population are buying things online, which is an impressive number. We're still getting some data in on the effects of e-commerce since COVID-19, but everyone agrees that it has skyrocketed for most, most sectors and especially for online groceries and um, big generalists. And just, just a one quick note about e-commerce. Um, I want to emphasize the importance of e-commerce for B2B, not just B2C. So um, most people think of e-commerce as just selling to somebody who's sitting um, at their, at their uh, countertop or in their, in their car. Um, and they're surprised at the prevalence of e-commerce for B2B transactions as well. Um, it's challenging to get consistent data, but by all measurements, it is absolutely huge. Um, at the end of 2018, Statista estimated a global B2B e-commerce market to be valued at around $10.6 trillion in 2019, which is about three and a half times the size of the B2C market. And um, just remember, keep in mind that you're still communicating with it and engaging with a person on the other side. So even if you are, your B2B product or service is a really high price point or very customized and you take, and you take a consultative sales approach, um, your website has to be compelling enough to encourage that call to action and convince the customer to request a contact because 
if they're purchasing the way that they purchase for themselves, they're most likely doing doing a lot of online research before actually reaching out to you. Samantha, terrific. Now I really am very, very pleased to 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 talk to a, a Wisconsin exporter. Let's let's give the the, the mic over to Laurent. Uh, Laurent Leduc uh, from, from Amsoil. Uh, we're, we're so pleased uh, that he joined us today. Laurent. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was asked to share uh, how Amsoil uh, developed and used a localized uh, website. So, uh, located in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, uh, Amsoil is a leader in the synthetic lubrication. Uh, Amsoil specializes in developing and manufacturing high-quality synthetic lubricants uh, to answer driver demand for best performance and protection for their cars, trucks, uh, motorcycle, boats, and power sport uh, equipment. Uh, throughout US and Canada, uh, Amsoil product can be purchased directly from our network of over 50,000 dealers or you can sign up directly at amsoil.com to become a preferred customer and receive 25% discount or free shipping. However, next slide. Um, outside uh, USA, Amsoil products are available um, in over 78 countries via a network of independent distributors and importers. Uh, historically, Amsoil left local marketing to its international distributor, which created challenges such as um, inconsistent use of our trademark, uh, losing control of our messaging and product claim, uh, also losing control of a foreign domain name when replacing uh, and performing distributor. So three years ago, uh, we decided the most effective and affordable solution was localized regional website supported by social media, which allowed us to uh, build brand recognition, um, engage with consumer, uh, educate consumer about our product, and direct consumer where to buy Amsoil product in their country. Next slide. Today, Amsoil has localized website for, uh, here's an example of Latin America in Spanish. Next slide. In uh, Canada. Next slide in Australia, targeting Australia and New Zealand. Next slide. In India. Next slide. In Europe, where we have it both in English and in French. Um, this website also allows us, yeah, that was good, to the next slide. Uh, this website also allow us to leverage the sites uh, not only to address uh, to reach out to consumers but to potential distributors so in this example we have a good distributor in the uk but we're searching now for an additional distributor to target ireland so we're able on the european website also to target specific part of europe uh, looking here for a, a new distributor for ireland next slide so how did we do it? Um, so with the collaboration of uh, IBT, uh, we first built a mini website in English. The reason we had to do that is our Amsoil.com website is huge, hundreds of pages. We could not really uh, translate hundreds of pages and keep them updated all the time. So we created a mini in English uh, website which could easily be uh, translated in other languages, uh, customized for local product focus, or to highlight a local distributor, and also to meet uh, local regulation. So each site also can be optimized uh, for uh, keyword search, um, and also use relevant content to local market, which is really important for us. 
Um, so for example, next slide. Uh, in January, here in the, uh, Wisconsin, Canada, uh, it's the peak of uh, snowmobile season in January, but it's middle of summer in Australia, and it's their motorcycle season. Um, in Latin America, at the same time, we can focus on new product. Um, next slide. So these sites have allow us to also uh, release product lookup guide tailored to regional market. So these guides, for example, on the Amazon.com, any consumer can go to find uh, the relevant uh, product for their specific vehicle. But guess what? Um, in, in the US, for example, uh, how many Renault or Peugeot car do you see? So we don't have that information on our US lookup guide but this is much more relevant uh, for Europe or the market. So uh, this was uh, a platform that allow us to bring these tools that are very popular with consumers and tailor them to the region. We can also tailor each of these websites to the product that our distributor are carrying. So if some distributor don't want to carry a whole product line, we're able to tailor the uh, product available on the website locally. So in, in conclusion, I mean, in today's world, uh, despite having Google Translate, I would say don't rely exclusively on your US website. I mean, localized website uh, will allow your company to expand is its brand awareness overseas, engage uh, with local consumer uh, provide your distributor with a tool so they can build also their own website in their own language. If you don't want to have 50 different language, this is the route Amsol went where we decided to have more regional websites, so a website for Latin America, a website for Europe. And then this website can be used by our local distributor to translate that into, let's say, Polish or Greek. So they have already a website that is small enough that it's cost efficient for them to use and translate in their own language. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. There's, there's quite a few questions that have come in just around um, when you were talking as well. I think there's a lot of interest in, 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 in that experience um, that you've had. We'd now like to just quickly especially as we're running a bit late, we'd like to talk about um, the Wisconsin Online Global Programs, just uh, uh, you know, giving you some outline. These are uh, programs that we've developed with Wisconsin called the Online Global Program, uh, which allows you to harness, get um, uh, localized websites um, with or without uh, online marketing, uh, just to sort of start off. And, 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 and there, I think, you know, obviously on this slide, you'll see some of the the, the major benefits that we see uh, companies really, you know, what what motivates the companies, particularly is just, you know, generating leads, growing international sales, and building brand awareness. Um, I wanted to highlight a company that uh, just very recently signed up, and and I think it's interesting because it was a very clear explanation from this company. Um, they they make some grinding wheels for. For, 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 for the wood industry, but also the avia, avia, aviation and aero um, and uh, automobile industry. And they, they really said, you know, different companies are going to open up at different times and in different countries. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time, these normal supply chains are a little bit broken. So if you're, if you're re robust at the moment, if you've got some good international team and if you're still manufacturing, this is actually a really good time to shake those trees. Um, a lot of your competitors are not manufacturing. Go out there, get yourself a proper website, go international. That was the motivation for this company now to just uh, push ahead uh, for that. And it's very, very, very much an old fashioned, well, yeah, I guess you could call it quite old fashioned industry, very face to face uh, uh, when you're visiting clients and visiting their shop floor. And now it's all about online tools. It's all about you know the webinars, the online, the, the Zooms, the websites, and the online marketing. And this is a company just doing that. Um, for Wisconsin, global um, online global, there's there are two options. Samantha, maybe you could 
talk us through those two options. Yeah, I would be happy to. So the two options for website localization starts with option A, which is a two market expansion with a limited scope. So 12 web pages and 2000 words for each separate website. By the end of option A, you will have two websites completely localized for your top two target markets. So for this example, one in German for Germany and one in French for France. These websites will be based off of your US site, um, but we will go through a whole localization process, including proper domain names, local hosting, SEO keyword research, industry specific translators, regulatory compliance, and just so much more. Um, so by having these websites, they will help you be found, be understood, and be easier to do business with in your top markets. In terms of budget, option A costs $12,000, but there are grants available upon WEDC approval, which Aaron will go over in just a minute. Um, option B is anything above and beyond the scope of work of option B, uh, of option A, I'm sorry. So um, maybe your company is looking for website redesign, or maybe you want to add international e-commerce, or maybe you only want one entry, but a huge scope of work, like 50 pages and 30,000 words. So well beyond the 12 pages and 2,000 words limit of option A. Um, then option B would be for you. And the budget of option B is completely dependent on the scope of work. But um, just like option A, there are grants available um, with the WEDC approval. And then there's option C. So option C is international online marketing. So once you have uh, your localized websites up and running, um, we can do the international online marketing piece. And this includes search engine marketing, social media marketing, and reporting and analytics. Um, there are handouts attached to, attached to this webinar that are completely free and that dive a little bit deeper into the online environment and um, the social media marketing in, in Canada, uh, Mexico, China, and the UK um, that are absolutely free. You can check those out. But if, you know, free free resources um, and, and you know, the internet just isn't enough help, um, our technical team would be happy to help you guys with your international online marketing. The budget for this is $1,500 per market per month, but there is a recommended ad spend of $900 for um, paid search engine marketing and social media marketing. And there are grants available um, that Aaron will go over um, in the next slide. <laughs> before we before we turn to Aaron for our final piece on grants, um, perhaps we could just launch that last poll that we have, um, just to ask uh, registrants and attendees uh, if they would like more information on either Program A or Program B or Program C um, via um, you know the online global programs and. Um, uh, on that, and if you and if you would like that, uh, would you like would like us to do that soon? Um, you know, we'd like us to to, to to contact you at all, and then um, you know, let us know. I was going to wait until the last of you have uh, have voted, but we thank you very much indeed on that, and we will definitely be getting in touch with you then um, uh, very soon. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Right, let's move on then to Aaron. And Aaron. Oh, hello. Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> I was, I was panicking for a moment. Well, good morning. Uh, this is Aaron Zitzelberger. I'm the International Grants Manager at the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Just wanted to take a quick second. I know we're running short on time, but I did want to thank uh, all the folks at IBT for their hard work in putting this together today. I uh, also wanted to thank everybody who's taking the time to uh, to be on the, the webinar today. I know that uh, with everything going on, it's a, it's a challenging time, so we appreciate you uh, being part of this. And uh, as Katie Sennett said earlier, just wanted to, to say that uh, uh, our thoughts are, are with everybody as we as we try to traverse uh, uh, everything that is going on. Um, also wanted to just mention to uh, Laurent, if he's still on, how excited I was to see a company from Superior uh, joining us today. I, I grew I grew up spending a whole lot of time up in uh, the North Woods up there and uh, have family up there. And, and it's, it's, it's great to see uh, companies thriving in Northern Wisconsin. So, um, with that, I just, as I said, I have a short amount of time today, so you know, don't have as much time to get into the, the level of detail with the grant options at WEDC that, that maybe I would like. 
So this is meant to be you know, much more high level. Um, so with that, I would just encourage you to please you know, reach out to myself. The, the contact information will be at the end. Um, you can always feel free to, to reach out to myself um, or my colleague, uh, Katie Wall, who's our International Grants Coordinator, um, to discuss a, a potential project or if you have questions about um, grants, uh, what might be a, a project that, that fits within the scope of, of our parameters and, and things like that. Um, it's always great to have a conversation. And um, so just please feel free to take advantage of that. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention, you know, as with businesses, COVID-19 has, has obviously caused uh, organizations to have to make adjustments. WEDC is, is no different. Um, so, you know, as we are in the process right now of kind of finalizing our grant requirements, our applications, um, our budget uh, for, for fiscal year 21, which, which opens up uh, momentarily, um, and, and we'll hopefully have all that done soon. And I would let you, I would just say, you know, please be sure to, to reach out to myself or visit WEDC's website in the coming weeks and months for, for updated information. So uh, just jumping in real quick with, with that, you know, companies that want to grow, know they need to export. Uh, they, navigating the global marketplace requires a lot of specialized knowledge and strategy based on, on proven best practices. And, and WEDC is here to uh, help you gain insights to tap new international markets. Our global uh, business development program helps companies lay the foundation for new export strategy or build on uh, existing export programs. There's really three things in the, in the WEDC grant portfolio that I wanted to, to touch on today um, in, in the short time I have. Our international market access grant, we call it an IMAG, our collaborative market access grant, which we call uh, a CMAG. And, and then I just I wanted to briefly touch about uh, touch on uh, the, the SBA uh, STEP uh, federal programs. Um, STEP is our state trade expansion program. And, and we do receive STEP funding and, and we get a lot of questions about that. So I thought it was worth um, just touching on very, very briefly. Um, in looking at the IMAG, uh, I, I want to talk and spend most of my time real quick here on, on the International Market Access Grant because it's it's what we do the most of. It's it's the grant that is probably most uh, uh, in line with what we're talking about here today. It, it's got a lot of uses. Um, so uh, let's talk about that a little bit. So Wisconsin companies can be reimbursed for specific expenses associated with an export project that will help grow their presence in an international market. And what we've done with the IMAGs is we've, we've kind of capped uh, two levels. We've tiered the levels of, of support that a company can get. The initial support level of support that a company can receive is a $10,000 grant, and they can receive up to three of those, one per year. And if, they, if a company uh, goes through and completes a program called Export Tech, and I, I don't really have a lot of time to get into the details of Export Tech, but I, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more in a second. Um, a company that completes Export Tech uh, is then um, able to uh, receive or be eligible for um, a grant, a grants of up to $25,000 annually. And instead of up to three total grants, they are able to receive up to six grants, one again, one per year. So $25,000 annually, one per year, um, up to six times. So, um, and, and the reason that we, that we do that is um, the Export Tech program, it, it really helps small to mid-sized Wisconsin companies tap into new markets uh, with a customized export expansion strategy. Um, they understand what their, their target companies are. They, they kind of demystifies that world of, of export. And, and we want companies to go into export projects with their eyes open and, and with a good strategy. And so we, we encourage people to look at the export tech program um, and, and, and take advantage of that so that they can make the most of the funds uh, that they're getting from WEDC. So, uh, I, I would also just mention, you know, just with regard to the, the export tech, the higher level of grants, you know, as we're looking at our budget for fiscal year FY21, which starts in July, um, you know, I don't know kind of the, the number of grants that are going to be available at the $10,000 and $25,000 level. Our budget isn't finalized yet. I just wanted to, again, encourage folks, uh, you know, we'll be getting that budget set soon and, and, and we'll have more information then. So just be sure you're kind of on the lookout for that. So the IMAG is a reimbursement grant, uh, which means it's not something where we're, you know you apply and then you get the money and you go out and do it. What you what you do is you uh, you apply first, you get approved before incurring any expenses, then you engage in the activity, and then you submit a reimbursement request, and then you get paid. What we want to see is activities that are part of a strategic plan and include activities that you really wouldn't be able to do on your own um, if you didn't have grant funds. 
So um, we recently closed our IMAG applications for fiscal year 20. Um, our, our, we'll open up our fiscal year 21 applications again um, this fall. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And uh, if you have questions, you know, you can certainly reach out to us anytime. Um, how to use an international market access grant. I like to talk about the IMAGs um, in, in kind of in four buckets. Um, so the first bucket being, I'm sorry, you can, yep, perfect. There, I'm glad to see that the slides are moving forward as I'm rambling on here. Uh, the first bucket really is trade trips, meetings, um, and trade missions. So non-WEDC sponsored international trade uh, missions, um, registration and booth expenses for international trade shows and exhibits, um, shipping charges. So if you have materials that you're going to a trade show, and uh, this has happened quite a few times. I, I was working with a company in Milwaukee who makes very large kind of engine components, and they wanted to go to a trade show. And I mean, you can imagine these really large things, how much shipping charges are for that, especially for a small to medium company. It's, it, it was really cost prohibitive for them to be able to do that. So shipping charges to those trade shows uh, for displays, things like that. Um, In-country interpreter services, that's part of that first bucket again for trade shows. That's that first bucket. The second that you see there is market customization. So costs associated with foreign language translation of brochures and product materials, um, design services, printing, marketing, and advertising at trade shows or within the target market, uh, as we're talking about today. So website, microsites, landing pages, translation or hosting for a specific market, um, that kind of fa that falls into that market customization bucket. So if that's what your project revolves around, um, you'd want to be looking at um, your budget for that. Um, company product, um, international trademark or foreign trade zone certification registrations, that's covered. Um, that's the second bucket. The third bucket is consulting services. So if you're a business, um, so business services provided by WEDC's authorized trade representatives or um, US Department of Commerce's services such as Gold Key. Um, consulting services. So if you're moving forward with CE or UL or CCC mark certifications or trademark registrations and you need consulting service um, or legal or professional or governmental fees needed to meet the certification standards, that falls into that third bucket. That fourth one is, is really around export education and competency building. So if, you know, if you're looking at uh, export related conferences or seminars or meetings, um, you know, things that you want to gain more knowledge around exporting, that's certainly something that is an allowable expense. Um, language competency, um, things like that. There are some ineligible expenses, and I and I and I want to mention some. Just I'm not going to go through this exhaustive list, just because um, it, it, it there are some things here, and this is where um, a, a discussion around what your project is um, is always very helpful. And again, I would encourage anybody who's looking at applying for a WEDC grant to contact us, so that we can just have a brief conversation. What are you looking to do? Uh, what's the budget look like? Um, and, and we can tell you, hey, this is covered, this isn't, or, you know, and kind of move forward from there. So, you know, things that we don't cover traditionally have been um, airfare and hotel, um, salaries, um, you know, travel expenses, so passport costs, things like that. Um, some, you know, meals, are, uh, you know, just stuff like that. So there's just, a, there is a list of, of non-allowable expenses, and it's just important that, that we have that discussion um, at the beginning. Um, I would also mention, Thank you for the slide moving forward. Uh, I would also mention, uh, typically with the IMAGs, we have always had a, a match component to that program. Um, so it's been a 30% match. So a company that, that gets a $10,000 grant would be required to put $3,000 of their own funds into the project as well. Uh, we're, re we're revisiting that right now, and I don't have any definitive information. I, I want to wait until we kind of the guidelines have been posted. Uh, it is something that, you know, kind of in this post-COVID-19 or current COVID-19 world, we, we understand that for small to medium business, it's a, it, that would be something that could be, you know, prohibitive for them to, to take advantage of a grant, and we want to get this money out in the world and have it do great things. So th there may be a, a time this, this year uh, for FY21, I'm not sure. Uh, where we will not maybe require the match component. We're considering that right now. And again, I would just look and encourage you to revisit the guidelines um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, that's IMAG in a, in a quick, very, very quick nutshell. I, I did want to mention the, the collaborative market access grant. Uh, if we can just, yep, uh, go on to the next slide, please. Oh, there we go, collaborative market access grant. So our CMAGs, um, typically, uh, CMAGs are larger grants that we make to industry associations uh, with the Wisconsin chapter, 
um, a state or local agency or department or a regional economic development organization or some kind of nonprofit, um, any of those organizations that are seeking to create an international export project that supports Wisconsin companies uh, and their export growth. Um, these are kind of, I kind of like to refer to these in, in a lot of ways as um, like a block grant of the IMAGs that we just talked about. So if a, a company wants to do a, um, uh, some kind of trade um, mission for their particular uh, or, or visit a trade show for their uh, particular members because they get a big, big discount or uh, something like that, uh, we would be able to do a larger grant, um, you know, typically 50 to to $100,000. And how the CMAG works is the organization has to have the ability to the administrative capacity to administer the grant. So that kind of takes that burden off of us and it shifts it to the organization that's, that's ma managing the project to, to kind of administer this, uh, to administer this grant. So um, it's just something to be thinking about if, if, if that kind of falls into your world. Um, I did want to briefly talk about the application information. Um, you, so the really how the application process works, if you, if you have an interest in applying for, for one of these grants, is you reach out to WEDC, either myself generally or my colleague Katie Wall, and we will walk you through the process again, cover any logistical details, um, and we will send you uh, a secure customized link uh, to an application for you, um, and you fill that out and submit everything electronically. I like to think it's a pretty, pretty uh, uh, easygoing kind of kind of application. I don't think it's too cumbersome. Um, submit that. It goes to our underwriting who reviews it and then our, our legal department as well for contracting. Uh, we generally like to say six to eight weeks is, is what it takes for, uh, for a grant application to, to go through. Um, so just keep that in mind that you know when you're looking at your project and when you need to be making decisions to uh, whether or not you know you're going to have these grant funds available, you want to be working backwards thinking six to eight weeks for approval. Um, because we really we can't reimburse for prod for uh, for expenses prior to the point that you get approved for um, the grant. So uh, just be thinking about that. Um, again, our application window typically opens the last week in September, and our application window typically closes April 1st. So we just finished off um, our FY20, and then our our FY21 window should open in September. Um, and again, as you can see, their projects begin upon acceptance, and, and typically you will need to complete your uh, your, prod, your stated project no later than the end of the calendar year. Um, I covered already the, the graduate, uh, the export tech, and, uh, and, and non-export tech uh, information. Um, can we jump to the next slide? Uh, so one last thing I did want to mention, and I know we're running really long. I apologize. Uh, Wisconsin does get uh, STEP funds, State Trade Expansion Program funds from the uh, Small Business Administration. Um, I get a lot of calls on this because a lot of states run their SBA STEP program similar to how we run our IMAG program, where they're just smaller grants, $10,000, $15,000 that companies can apply for for a particular export project. That's not how Wisconsin uh, uses our, our step funds. How we use our step funds is we use it to underwrite the cost of, of our trade ventures that we do, uh, which is one of the things that keeps um, our trade ventures so uh, affordable for companies to attend. So if you're looking to go to um, you know, China or Australia uh, or Mexico or any of the other places that we go in a typical year, um, you, know, you would reach out, you could talk to any one of our market development directors or, or give me a call, see where we're going and, and kind of explore whether or not that would be a good fit for you. We also have a, a, a sub-awardee in our Department of Agriculture, Transportation and Consumer Protection. Um, they also get step funds through the application that we submit. Um, so that helps underwrite the cost of, of, the, of their trips as well. Um, so if you're a um, food and, and or, you know, a farm or, or uh, department of, you know, anything that kind of falls into that agricultural world um, and, and you have an interest in attending a, an event through them, um, you could certainly reach out to DATCAP, uh, Department of Ag, Transportation and Consumer Protection, um, to see if that might be a, a good fit for you as well. So um, again, with that, I would just say I, 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 it's a lot of information to digest in a short time. Please feel free to email me, call me. I'm happy to meet in person when the time comes. I'm happy to have a, a, a call um, or send out in for more information. Um, and uh, look forward to working with you. And please uh, encourage everybody you know, take advantage of these funds. Uh, they're out there to, uh, to help you. And, and we look forward to, uh, to partnering with you on your, on your projects going forward. Aaron, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry that we're so rushed for time with um, 
we, we packed too much into this webinar. We <laughs> wanted to summarize also the three options that we're proposing um, in terms of the Wisconsin online global programs for the localized websites. And really just to reinforce Aaron's message, take advantage of the resources that Wisconsin offers its companies. You have a very proactive, energetic team in the WDEC, you know, use them. <laughs> um, I guess a, a final message from us really just sort of um, saying, you know, in this time, a difficult time, sort of, you know, look after yourselves, look after your communities, um, look after your loved ones, be, be, be well, be safe, um, take care. We have a lot of questions. Um, we have um, uh, our takeaways and questions. Uh, just summarizing them um, in terms of some takeaways and, and Q&A. Uh, uh, yes, you will get this slide deck. You will get this, this webinar recording in your inbox uh, in two days' time. Um, from us, the, the, the message is really communicate now. Now is an excellent time to form and to reinforce and engage in relationships with your customers, your clients, your prospective customers and clients globally. Um, uh, uh, do so through online uh, uh, business tools like websites and uh, online marketing. And the reason you can do that is one, because everyone is online, and two, to prepare for that rebound uh, uh, for that. So those are the, the, the two messages that we also wanted to, to just reinforce from this webinar. Um, we're hoping also to do another webinar. We'll be a bit more respectful of time uh, on online marketing, uh, given your enthusiastic response to that. We, we would hope to, and perhaps we can give Aaron a bit more time to talk about the um, uh, um, uh, funding available. Some very, very quick questions um, for you. We, we have quite a few questions also for Laurent and for, for Aaron. And if I could just start perhaps just one or two, and then you know, we will cut it uh, short then. And if you have not responded to a lot of the questions that come in, we'll send you an email uh, reply. But just quickly to, to Laurent, um, do you have, Laurent, do you have any yes. view on returns of in, on investment, um, the, on the efficiency of the websites and how do you, how do you measure it? Uh, good question. I mean, <clears throat> marketing is usually tough to really look at return on investment but for us the way we monitor it is really the number of visitors we can bring to each of the website then how many people do we have using the lookup guide and then how many people do we convert to look at where to buy so this is how uh, we really monitor the um, monthly pro uh, progress of our website. Um, and as you mentioned earlier with the example of Indonesia uh, versus uh, Germany, um, the behaviors of consumers around the world and uh, can be very, very different. Uh, similar to what you explained, we see that in Mexico and India where we have a lot of engagement, but a much smaller percentage of people looking at where to buy. On the opposite, uh, our site in uh, Europe or Australia, we get much higher return, but lower traffic. Um, so uh, I would say every market is, is different. The behaviors of the consumer is different. So don't really expect the same for each of your markets. Thank you, Laurent. Just while I have you, one more question just for you, Laurent. Just from, from another Wisconsin company, did you get any um, uh, resistance from any re distributors? And how did you deal with distributors who didn't want to fall in that line? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. There are a resistance sometimes from, from distributors um, who feel they're going to lose control. Um, and usually it's really uh, in improving communication with your, with your distributor. In our experience, if you don't have good communication with your distributor, it's never going to really work well long time, uh, long term. So uh, communication is, is key. Um, and to show them um, that uh, they're going to be part of it. So include them also in the choice of the product you're going to be featuring in that region. 
um, of course, it, the natural fear of the distributor is that you're going to be bypassing them, going directly in their country. So you have to really understand their concern and, and address that. Great, terrific. Thank you very much, Laurent. A quick, very quick question for Aaron. Um, for the IMAGs, is there a set number of companies that can apply? If so, how do you allocate the funds at first come, first serve basis? Uh, great question. Uh, there's not a set number necessarily can, that can apply. Um, I guess you know it's going to ultimately be dictated by uh, yeah by uh, by what the budget uh, whatever the budget is. So um, yeah, I mean it's first come first serve. Um, I think that you know for for this next year, I think what we'll probably do uh, just a, an added component to that very well may be that we might might prioritize companies. Uh, that can show, you know, that can demonstrate a, a, an impact of, of COVID-19. Again, that's kind of some of the things that we're talking about right now. Um, but typically, it will be first come, first serve. So again, my, my I would encourage companies as soon as that window opens, or, or even before, let's have that initial discussion about your projects, and uh, and uh, that way you can have your application, um, you know, ready to go as soon as that application window opens. Thank you very, very much. We wanted to, I wanted to thank all our, our panelists and, and, and organizers today for a terrific, terrific webinar. We've packed way too much into one webinar. We hope to get back to you again and drill down in some of the detail, as we've had quite a lot of um, uh, positive feedback from you during the webinar as well. I want to thank Katie and Aaron from the WDC, and especially Laurent from Amsoil for joining us today. And a special shout out to uh, my colleague, Samantha. Thank you all very, very much for attending. Happy, happy trading, happy exporting, stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you online and offline soon. So um, uh, take care, be well, and thank you all very much for, for uh, participating. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.